Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, welcome to the third day of the International Congress. I, I'm Dinesh Bhugra. Uh, it's my pleasure to be chairing this session. Our speaker this morning in the world and actually say that needs no introduction. And Vikram certainly does not need any introduction. If I were to read out his CV, we'll be here till tomorrow morning. And I'm sure you don't want me to ramble on, but you want to listen to what Vikram has to say. I first met Vikram when he was a trainee. Um, he won growth scholar and came to Oxford and from Oxford moved to the Maudsley. And over the years, it's been a pleasure to see him blossom and contribute uh, remarkably to uh, world psychiatry. I'm not going to say any more about Vikram. Vikram is currently uh, Vice President of the Public Health Foundation of India. And uh, among many things, I think he's the only person, only psychiatrist in the world who has more air miles than I do. Um, so without further ado, Vikram. Thank you very much, Amish. Uh, so first of all, I want to say what a pleasure it is to be at this College Congress. Uh, uh, in fact, it's my very first time ever in um, uh, giving a plenary talk at the Congress. So I'd like to start by thanking uh, uh, the organizers, uh, um, the program organizers, for this wonderful opportunity to speak to my fellow colleagues in the college. Um, I think many of you, uh, my, 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 from my record, memory as a uh, jobbing uh, psychiatrist who was training here in Britain more than 20 years ago now, uh, I think most of you would probably have a primary preoccupation with the quality of care and the condition of the health system here in Britain. But my focus has been to a large extent, as with the colleagues in the discipline of global mental health, uh, on the conditions of care of people living in much less resource countries. And my talk today really here is intended to share with you some of the innovative approaches that people working in extremely different and often very difficult circumstances have sought to improve the quality and access to care for people with mental health problems and then perhaps provocatively suggest that maybe some of these lessons actually have a great value in thinking about how we might re-engineer mental health care system even in well-resourced settings. Now, I want to start off by simply, first of all, addressing a little bit about what this discipline of global mental health is uh, and the innovations then that it has actually invented and evaluated in order to improve the access and quality to care, and then go a little bit beyond at the end of my talk to think about how these innovations might also, in fact, address what I consider an equally big gap, not just the treatment gap, which of course I think most of you will be familiar with, but provocatively, as I said, to really refer to the credibility gap, uh, which is essentially the gap between the way psychiatry conceptualizes mental health problems and what most other people in the world around us conceptualize them. So the field of global mental health is fairly, fairly new. Um, I would date it back to the year 2007 as a kind of a discrete uh, a discipline when the Lancet Medical Journal uh, pretty much for the first time uh, produced a series of papers uh, specifically focused on conditions of care for people with mental health problems in low and middle income countries. Of course, global mental health is primarily a hybrid discipline of global health whose main concerns are issues of equity uh, and effectiveness in particularly low resource settings with a goal of reducing health inequalities uh, within and between populations. Uh, it is a hybrid of global health along with psychiatry and the other clinical mental health disciplines. Obviously, since the inequalities are greatest in the developing countries of the world, global mental health's primary focus has been historically in those countries. But, of course, inequalities are also evident in rich and well-resourced countries, and therefore, some of the ideas that come from global mental health actually have great bearing on the practice of psychiatry in rich countries. The most important focus of global mental health has been the so-called treatment gap. This is essentially the proportion of people in any population who have a mental health problem uh, and who could have benefited from the evidence-based intervention but in fact do not receive those interventions. Uh, although the figure here of 90% actually does come from a real systematic review, what is ironic about this figure really is that this figure comes from India and China, two of the best resourced countries 
in the developing world. So in fact, if one considers the situation, for example, in many sub-Saharan African countries, the treatment gap would probably approach 100%. Bear that in mind. Nearly all people with mental health problems, both common and severe, do not have access to the kind of care that a significant proportion of Britain's population can take for granted. Now, there are many barriers that uh, people working in these contexts have had to really address. Of course, the one barrier that we're all familiar with, and the one that perhaps uh, is also true in rich countries, is that of inadequate skilled human resources. I often hear in Britain, whenever I'm here, uh, that there is a real crisis of recruitment of psychiatrists, there's a real crisis of recruitment of psychologists, etc. Uh, and so there are shortages of these mental health professionals in Britain as well. Well, the situation is much graver in developing countries, and I'll turn to that in a moment. However, I don't think it is only a supply side barrier. I think there's also, very importantly, a demand side barrier. And I think I will turn to this towards the end of my talk. And the demand side barrier really reflects what I believe is a yawning gap, particularly in the area of common mental health problems, in the way that people in society conceptualize these problems and the medical model that we often approach. There's also, of course, in developing countries, other demand side barriers, particularly for policymakers. Policymakers are struggling with a number of other public health priorities like infectious diseases, and there are limited resources, and therefore there's competition for those resources. There's, of course, the usual bugbear of stigma and low political commitment, which I think is pretty universal as well. So over the last 10 to 15 years, people across the developing world have been innovating in various ways in order to address both supply side and demand side barriers. And what I'm about to now present to you is really a synthesis of what are the key elements of these innovations. In these innovations, we can see four different ways in which mental health care has been fundamentally re-engineered or redefined. Firstly, what actually comprises an intervention for mental health problems? Secondly, where these interventions are provided? Thirdly, who is a mental health provider? And lastly, how are these interventions delivered? I'm going to take you through each of these in turn. Let's first look at the composition of a mental health care intervention. Typically, the way we've been taught is that we start with a diagnosis. We have to diagnose a person utilizing a particular diagnostic system, and typically that diagnosis will then open the door to a, an algorithmic approach to the application of treatments. This is typically how treatment guidelines, for example, are developed and intended to be applied in real-world clinical settings. There are a number of problems with this. The first is, of course, the meaning of that diagnosis. How do you apply a diagnosis in a place where it has absolutely no meaning? And this is, of course, very true for almost all the diagnoses applied to common mental health problems in most parts of the world. The second problem is that there is a one-size-fits-all approach, which might work well for a condition like malaria, but, of course, doesn't work at all well for complex conditions such as depression or anxiety or indeed any mental health problem due to the complex interaction between personal environmental, uh, uh, environmental factors that make it quite unique for each individual. And lastly, of course, the intervention packages that are promoted are entirely those that come from a very biomedical, uh, psychiatric or psychological approach, completely ignoring often other intervention approaches that are already prevalent in most parts of the world. I think it's important to recognize, of course, that people with mental health problems have sought and received care uh, from a variety of different traditions of healthcare well before psychiatry came into being. So what's the global mental health way? And again, this is really a very uh, simplistic uh, 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 synthesis of, of these very many different kinds of innovations. First of all, is to eschew the use of diagnostic labels completely. So for example, in 20 years of working with depressive anxiety and trauma-related disorders, I have almost never used an ICD-10 diagnosis, either in my interventions or in my clinical work in either Africa or Asia. So to move towards more distress models that are far more friendly uh, to ordinary people and also much more aligned with community attitudes about mental health problems. Secondly, to prioritize not clinical outcomes in our planning of treatment, but to actually prioritize the outcomes that matter to people. And of course, those of you who are familiar and, and, and aligned to the recovery movement would immediately recognize the parallels there. <coughs> 
Thirdly, to move away from offering biomedical interventions to everyone with a mental health problem, but to really triage people, the majority of people in fact, who often have mild and transient and reactive problems to uh, social interventions, uh, including pretty low-cost interventions such as befriending, uh, and also to emphasize the use of existing resources in the community, including alternative healing traditions where appropriate. And finally, and this is looking ahead into the future, moving away from a very disorder-based packages of care, particularly in the area of psychological treatments, uh, and moving uh, firmly towards transdiagnostic treatments, an area which I believe holds a lot of promise in the future for all countries. Let me now turn to the second important uh, 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 aspect of the delivery of mental health care, which is being re-engineered, and this is the location of the treatment delivery. Now, for most of us, typically, we will sit in our offices and clinics in uh, NHS trusts, and we would expect people to walk in through the door and we'll see them there. The problem for most parts of the world is that actually most psychiatric services are still provided in large mental hospitals or in institutions that are actually extremely, uh, well, in a sense, uh, face challenges to do with the quality of care. In the most extreme end, you will see uh, very difficult circumstances for people who are admitted in those hospitals uh, bordering on frank abuses of their basic human rights. Another very important limitation of these psychiatric settings is the absence of uh, access to psychosocial interventions. So most of the care tends to be custodial, uh, as you saw in the asylums in Britain 50 years ago, uh, and purely pharmacological. So the Global Mental Health Solution has been to really rethink where we should provide mental health care, moving out of the hospital, moving out of the psychiatric clinic, and moving into the same locations where the vast majority of people with mental health problems actually seek care. Typically that, of course, is the equivalent of the general practitioner clinic, which is a primary health center, for young people and children into schools, into community centers, and perhaps most excitingly, and perhaps most challengingly, into people's own homes, following actually a tradition that other aspects of global health, other disciplines of global health have followed. Consider, for example, the directly observed tuberculosis treatment, where the treatment is delivered directly in the home of the individual uh, by a health worker. Third aspect that we have re-engineered is the idea of who is a mental health provider. Within the orthodox model, it's people like us, people like, a, like us who are here at this conference. Uh, a range of different mental health professionals, psychiatrists, clinical psychologists, and psychiatric social workers. Now, of course, the problem is there are very few of us, not just in Britain, but even more so in developing countries. Consider the country where I worked in for the last uh, nearly two decades now. We have a population of 1.2 billion people, and for a moment, imagine if I translated the ratio of psychiatrists to the population in Britain to this population of 1.2 billion and converted that ratio into uh, absolute numbers of psychiatrists, uh, we would expect about 150,000 psychiatrists. The true number, of course, is a very small fraction of that. The vast majority of these 5,000 actually living and working in urban areas and at least half or more now working only in the private sector. So this would mean that there could be entire populations in India of up to 30 to 40 million people who have not a single psychiatrist available uh, for, their for, for mental health care. It's very obvious then, with this sort of not just absolute shortage, but also the inequities in distribution, uh, that we cannot rely on people like us to do the frontline job of mental health care. We have to do what other disciplines of global health have done, which is to use community-based workers, to use ordinary people who can be trained in specific tasks of mental health care. Now, when this idea was first proposed about 10 or 15 years ago, uh, many colleagues in the psychiatric profession uh, were very concerned, and rightly so actually, very concerned not just about the effectiveness of this care, but in fact the quality and the safety of this care. The good news now is that the evidence base on our sharing of mental health care interventions is growing and growing very fast. These three trials from Uganda, Pakistan and India were the first to actually demonstrate the effectiveness and the safety of interventions delivered by ordinary people with specific skills to deliver specific psychological interventions uh, for depressive and anxiety disorders. Since then, the evidence base has grown to more than 30 randomized controlled trials, uh, summarized here in this Cochrane Review by Nadia Van Kinnikan, uh, covering a range of mental health conditions from a range of low and middle income countries. 
I want to just show you one example of a forest plot that really comes from uh, a, a more recent systematic review that specifically looked at randomized controlled trials for psychological interventions delivered by non-specialized frontline workers for perinatal depression. And I just want to draw your attention to the summary estimate, which shows that there was a 40% reduction in the prevalence of depression in those mothers who received uh, this uh, non-specialized health worker delivered intervention. And finally, how do we actually deliver these interventions? Now, many of us assume that the star sharing means that we have actually removed the role of a mental health professional. In fact, that's completely untrue. The mental health professional remains a critical key member of a team. A team that, of course, uh, uh, involves an active participation and collaboration of a number of key people, uh, in, 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 including, of course, the general practitioner, and most importantly, the person with the mental health problem. So here are five key elements of collaborative care for the delivery of these interventions. They involve a proactive and opportunistic detection, interventions that are tailored to the needs of the individual and obviously include both pharmacological as well as psychosocial interventions, a chronic disease approach, the kind of approach we would see for diabetes or heart disease, uh, essentially an approach that involves long-term tracking of individuals with the ultimate goal of achieving uh, recovery, Concern with both clinical and social outcomes and a very active engagement of the individual with the condition uh, in self-management. This is a slide taken from uh, the late Wayne Caton's group in, uh, in Seattle, which uh, really I think they're at the epicenter of championing uh, models of collaborative care. And I think what this diagram really shows very nicely is the collaborative team with the patient at the heart and the three different kinds of health workers uh, who work in a partnership to ensure the best outcomes in that individual. Now, a key individual here is the case manager. Uh, and in many Western countries where this model has been rolled out, typically the case manager has been a professional, such as a social worker or a nurse. But in fact, in most developing countries, the case manager is typically the lay health worker, the community health worker that I mentioned a little earlier. If I had to actually bring together really a large proportion of these different trials and ask the question, what are the roles that the case manager plays? What are the common roles across all of these interventions? These are shown on this slide here. And I think most of these are quite intuitive, particularly the ones uh, at, the, at the upper end of the slide, the education, the support to the family, the support to adherence, but perhaps befriending may come as a surprise. This is where a community health worker literally befriends an individual who's often isolated by their mental illness and actually helps them re-socialize, for example, doing something fairly low, low intensity, like going to see a film together. And perhaps at the bottom of the list, you see the opposite end of intensity, which is the intensity of providing a psychological intervention, a structured psychological treatment, such as, for example, behavioral activation for depression. What's been the impact of this, this significant body of evidence of now more than 40 randomized control trials as I speak today? Well, first of all, there's been very important and, uh, impact on policy and practice, and I want to just give you three or four examples of that. Two years ago, the Indian government uh, published its first national mental health policy. I served on the group that drafted this policy. But what was very important about this policy was its complete orientation with the evidence that I've just presented to you. For example, the championing and the financing of collaborative care teams working through primary care with district hospital psychiatrists providing the specialist support. The World Health Organization produced its first ever treatment guidelines for mental, neurological, and substance use disorders in the year 2008, and there's a revision that will be out in a few months. The evidence base in these treatment guidelines were also very uh, strongly embedded within global mental health evidence. For example, these guidelines are primarily located in the provision of care in routine primary care settings rather than in mental health care settings. Just earlier this year, the Disease Control Priorities Project, which is a flagship project of the World Bank, which really seeks to look at evidence on cost-effectiveness of interventions, and in particular, interventions that can be delivered in routine healthcare platforms, produced uh, its set of recommendations for mental, neurological, and substance use disorders. This is really an important development. Uh, because the disease control priorities program is actually used by development economists to actually decide which intervention should be scaled up. And in the era of universal health coverage, which is one of the key health targets 
uh, for the Sustainable Development Goals, we are now on par and competing with, in fact, our colleagues in other areas of medicine to ensure that our interventions are seen as being attractive by economists uh, for financing for scale-up in universal health care. And finally, a very big event that happened in April this year. Some of you may have been uh, uh, present at this event. It's a big event because for the first time I witnessed the uh, President of the World Bank, Dr. Jim Kim, and the Director General of the World Health Organization, Dr. Martha Chan, together at the World Bank in uh, Washington, D.C. at the time of the annual meeting of the World Bank Ministers of Finance from around the world to make mental health, quite incredibly so, mental health, a global, not a health priority, but a global development priority. The good news is that there is now actually specific commitments from the World Bank, for example, that all loans given to countries for health sector reform will now necessarily have to include a mental health program uh, as a requirement if the World Bank has to approve the loan. This evidence has also generated a lot of impetus for the research agenda. As you might imagine, a lot of that research agenda has really been in the area of implementation, that is to bridge the no-do gap to bridge the gap between what we know works and actually what we in fact do with that in the real world. Yeah, this is of course a grand challenge of the Global Mental Health, which was a Delphi priority setting exercise for the field. Uh, and this has now triggered a significant amount of new resources uh, for global mental health funding. The setting up of five NIMH hubs, as you can see on this map, in five different regions of the world to promote this kind of research, and another five which are actually currently being funded, so there will altogether be ten NIMH-supported hubs for international mental health research. Uh, similarly, Grand Challenges Canada, which has had a very different kind of funding. In fact, the funding Grand Challenges Canada has been giving, which is the Canadian government's official international uh, aid uh, agency for, uh, for research in medicine, but the approach that Grand Challenges Canada has been taking isn't just a research approach, but really championing, championing innovations. And so again, we've seen through this funding mechanism a range of different players, particularly coming from non-mental health sectors, who are beginning to innovate uh, in the mental health care sector. And I think we should really celebrate the fact that our field is being adopted and espoused by many people from outside uh, our field. This year, we will soon see a very major call from the MRC here in Britain uh, to support global mental health alongside a partnership with some of the other research councils in the UK. For those of you who want to learn more about specific innovations, I would uh, encourage you to go to this website. This is the Mental Health Innovations Network, which is a joint uh, platform of the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine, where I work, uh, and the World Health Organization. You will see more than 100 innovations characterized, for example, according to which disorders they target, the sorts of innovations that they have actually used, and the parts of the world where they occur. Of course, you can sign up, you can join up. And this is not only about developing countries. When you go to the website, you will see that a large proportion of these innovations come from low resource settings, also in high income countries. I want to now show you a three-minute video that really shows how these innovations play themselves out. And I'm going to use the example of a trial for people with chronic schizophrenia, up chronic, more than 10 years on average duration, in a trial that we carried out in India in three different sites. And what I think the short video shows is really the roles of the different players in the collaborative care team uh, for people with schizophrenia. समायोजित वर्तमान काहीतरी आहे असं मला सारखं वाटायचं कोणाला कुठं बोलायचं हा एक माझ्या मनामध्ये कुचंबपणा व्हायचं आजूबाजूचे लोक ते दृष्टिकोनातून बघायचे की ज्या येडीचे हस्ती बघा तशी कोण माणूस पूर्ण येणार असला तरी त्याला असं वाटायचं ती माझ्याकडेच बघत हसली म्हणून तो माणूस असा बघत उभा राहायचा मग मी ते उभे राहायचे मी दोन तीन माणसांना पण आवलं लगी वाईट वाटायला लागलं ते झाडाला धरायची झाडाय कोणाला सांगायचं नाही ते असं तर देव वगैरे केले लाग भांडून नाही केला बरं का देवा ह्या देवा जा त्या देवा जा त्या अमक्याला पहा प्लेट पहा लांब लांब म्हणजे तो पाच सहा महिने आम्ही राखवला देवा जाय अप्रमाण उलट देवा वगैरे जास्तीत वाढायचं तर कधी नाही कॉप्सी हा प्रकल्प जो आहे तो त्याचा लॉंग फॉर्म असा आहे केअर केअर ऑफ पीपल सिझोफिनिया इन इंडिया म्हणजे औषध उपचाराव्यतिरिक्त 
जर का सामाजिक उपचार पद्धति जर योकान चालू के लिए डॉक्टर पेशंट ऐसी मतलब दुआ रोल होता पाठवा बर हो कारण आम महती नहीं कि कैसे कैसे का गोया गया कैसे का शिवाय आगे तुम्हें जे प्रोग्राम होता ना हाँ पुरेपूर फायदा आम औषध औषधांच तो औषधांपेक्षा जास्त मे संभाषण ने वहां है ना बोला जो पर्यत जमेल ना तो पर्यत तरी काम अपने जो पर्यत जमेल तो दिवस भर मे विचार दिवस भर हिंदा आज पर आज का So I want to now just finish by uh, thinking about how we can uh, what the what the implications of this kind of work is for thinking more broadly about the paradigms of mental health care. First of all, I think certainly in the developing country context, for me, it has meant shifting away from the discourse of asking your resource to actually being richly resourced, particularly with human and community resources. Our job then as psychiatrists is to identify how we can marshal those resources rather than simply calling for more of us. But in fact, I also think that this sort of evidence sets the stage potentially to challenge and provoke us into thinking about how a very medical model of care uh, has actually, what successes it's had, but also what its limitations are and what the implications are for re-engineering re healthcare systems in countries like Britain. I say this because, in fact, the treatment gaps aren't only a problem of developing countries. This particular chart that comes from Lancaster's World Men Mental Health Survey is really the top end of the slide shows you the treatment gaps in low and middle income countries uh, for quite serious levels of depressive and anxiety disorders. Um, not surprising really that more than 60-70% of people have not received any care in the last 12 months. However, look at the picture even in very well resourced countries. Countries with universal health care, a government funded health care system where costs, there are no costs associated with health care, with very significant investments in mental health care, including multidisciplinary teams with a very, very strong community orientation, and still between 50 to 60 percent of people, even in these countries, which have maybe 10 to 20 times more resources, actually still have not accessed anyone in the health care system uh, for their severe depression or anxiety. To me, this is actually partly, and my hypothesis is that it is partly a credibility gap. And this is the gap that I refer to as the gap between the concepts of mental disorders that mental health specialists use, particularly characterized by some of our diagnostic categories, the epidemiological instruments that derive from them, and some of our treatment paradigms, and how the rest of the world views these particular conditions. Of course, here I speak primarily for my work in India, where I have almost never met anyone with depression who thinks they have a mental health problem, but are very comfortable to talk about their symptoms in a distress model nested within the social worlds that they live in, and are completely happy to receive either medication or psychotherapy, but very reluctant if I presented them with a particular biomedical paradigm to explain their disorder. This is my last slide then. What are potentially the lessons for rich countries in terms of this evidence base? I would suggest there are two important lessons. Firstly, championing the development of community-based teams that are led by peers or community health workers working within a supportive and collaborative environment with people like ourselves, playing key roles of capacity building, supervision, providing referral pathways, and quality assurance. Secondly, to really move away from a biomedical paradigm, particularly for mild and transient conditions, and to start adopting distress models of care across the continuum, 
from distress at the mildest end all the way through to disability at the most extreme end if we are ever to bridge the credibility gap between psychiatric paradigms of mental health problems and those that the community holds. Thank you very much. Thanks very much, Vikram, uh, for a very clear exposition and plenty of food for thought. Since this is a plenary, uh, we do not have questions, but I'm sure uh, Vikram wouldn't mind if you wanted to corner and get his autograph, ask him questions, and uh, have your picture taken with him. He only charges five pounds per photograph. Uh, please join me in thanking Vikram once again for a very wonderful start. Of the day.